he was very loving, you know, um, he had a big heart, you know, he loved football, you know, he loved music, loved going to concerts. We loved playing, you know, playing Madden at night, you know, in the garage. My cousin, um, he was very fun to be around, like, all the time. Um, he knew how to make me laugh, and he knew how to even, like, make me mad, because he would come in my room and leave, but leave the door open and leave the light on. And everybody knew that, like, I hated that, but he would always do it. When I look at my brother's life, I think of how much he... Like, the whole point of being on Earth is to be loved and to love. And I think of how much he did those things, although his short, his life on Earth was very short. He's a very loving person. We, we love to get along with each other, but he, just like every other older brother would, he would always give me a hard time and bully me a little bit. But I could tell that he really did care about me, and I cared about him, and he would love to protect me and just make sure I was never in any sort of danger or anything. My fondest memories of Cedric, he loved the Lakers. He loved the Lakers, and he always had this uh, Lakers jersey in the closet. And I would open the closet, and I would always want to wear his jersey. I loved it. And I loved when he would take me around with his friends, like hanging out with them, playing basketball. And he was very protective over us. He really loved us. He had a big personality. It was, I don't know, you could have him room full of people and you would know who Ruben is, you know? That's the kind of personality he had. He was a little difficult to be around, but I enjoyed having his presence. I miss his presence a lot because now that he's actually gone, the bad things that he did, I miss that because it's, it's brotherly love how I looked at it. And then I miss that because now I don't have anybody I could joke around with Talk, have him mess with me and, and joke around. I, I, I don't have that anymore, and it sucks. Pretty typical when we were younger was the bullying me and picking on me and stuff like that. But as we both got older, it was like a, more of like we were friends. So, But for a while, it was just the picking on me, being overprotective. Funny. He was bad as, 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 in some aspects, you know, but he was a child, so... You know, all kids got to learn at some point in time. But he was funny. He was outgoing. I played basketball with him a lot. He was a good hooper, you know. I loved him. Everybody loved him. He was, you know, a lovable person. I feel like because we were the two oldest, um, <laughs> he was always encouraging me to do, like, impish things, like little childish things. Like, they were fun. It might have got us into a little trouble, but they were fun. We enjoyed ourselves. Um, he always, sorry. We, um, I remember our summers, um, when we would go visit my Nana and our uncle would take us to the basketball courts and I used to whoop him. <laughs> he was good, but I was better. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a lot of fun together. Like, if he had something and you ain't have it, he'd always make sure that you had a piece. Like, if, if he had something, like, you know, just stuff like that, he always make sure that he broke bread. We definitely had a lot of good laughs. Sometimes it'd just be, like, just little stuff. Just like anything, like just even if we was just sitting in the room, we was just always having fun. We was just out and about, just outside, just play basketball sometimes, just little stuff. He loved everyone. Um, he made sure he helped as much people as he can. Even when he didn't have anything for himself, he still made sure that everyone around him was okay. And he was just a very loving person. He was definitely one of my best friends. Um, we were only like a year apart. So we definitely had a lot in common. Um, we would um, 
we were basically just always together. And if it was like him and his friends who were like, hey, can we come here? And we would just like hang out, even if we were doing nothing but on our phones. Um, it was very important to us just to get the quality time together because on how we were, I always didn't talk to anybody but him because he made me feel safe because he just let me talk. So it was definitely like a best friend relationship we had. Out of all my cousins, he was, it, it gets me upset actually because he was like naturally gifted. Like he was that, he was the kind of kid who, who he can study 30 minutes before a test and ace it. Like he just, he was just naturally gifted, um, nat naturally smart, lucrative. Uh, and you know, anything he put his mind to, he, he went out to do it. And at, at a very young age, he, he was always very business oriented. Um, my older brother called me around 2.30 in the morning and he couldn't like, he couldn't speak. Like I just answered, I was like, hello. And like, he was just crying and crying. And I was like, Bubba, like talk to me, what's going on? And his girlfriend had to take the phone from him and she was like, baby Billy is not breathing. And I just, it just shattered my heart. And we left from Houston all the way to Kyle to go go see what's going on. Yeah, I found out later that he took like the Percocets like two weeks before he passed. And then I found out that it was a Percocet laced with fentanyl the day he died, cause that's what everybody was saying. I never thought my brother would die from an overdose, no matter how far he was into his addiction. I thought he'd end up on the street before he'd end up dead. Me and my mom had multiple conversations about that. So when I woke up to my mom and my dad sitting at the end of my bed, just pouring in tears, it, I knew something was up and they told me the news. One of my nieces, she used to do like this um, prayer line with her friends and she invited my brother to, hey, I want you to get on this prayer call. And he said, like, all day he was trying to get out of the house. He was, you know, trying to get out. But for whatever reason, he couldn't leave that day. So he said, okay, I'll get on this prayer call. And so um, they ended up, like, praying for him. And they had him read, read Psalm 91. And he was like, oh, you know, this was awesome. I'm going to come back on the next night. Well, the next night, you know, nobody could find him. Nobody could get a hold of him for a couple days. Um, when he was found, they believe he had already been gone for two days. And that was so devastating to know that, you know, he died alone. All this happened so quick. You know, it was, it was like within months, he went from someone I knew on, I, I used my best friend to someone I had no idea who he was within a matter of weeks. Growing up, my mom, she was really strong, you know, having seven kids and doing the best that she could. And I never saw my mom cry. And the first time I saw my mom cry was at my brother's wake. And so this is what fentanyl does to people. A couple hours goes by, Carlos calls me again, tells me, hey, you're not gonna like what you're about to hear. And from whenever, from before he even told me that he was dead, I knew just I could feel something wasn't right. And because whenever I was on the phone with him, I could tell that he was high. I could tell that, you know, he was, he did something. And whenever I saw that, immediately came to my mind was, you know, what could happen. Because this isn't the only time that it's happened. It's happened two other times before where he's overdosed and died. And so that was the first thing that came to my mind whenever I saw him high. So before anything was even said, you know, that was kind of in the back of my head. And I hate to say that, like, I saw this coming, but it didn't come as a surprise. So it wasn't just out of the blue. 
So whenever I heard that, you know, he was gone, he passed away, I just made me mad, you know, it just made me feel like not necessarily mad at him, but just, just why did it have to end this way, you know? His baby mother kept calling us, asking if we've heard from Ruben. And so uh, I, I called him, texted him, and, and it had been four hours since I'd actually heard from him. And so uh, she started talking about she's going to she's gonna call uh, SAPD, I think that's what it is, San Antonio Police Department, to do a wellness check on him and make sure he was okay. And uh, it was probably like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the police came by my house and started just, just started knocking. And then uh, they started talking to my mom about it and just saying that he had passed and that they had uh, figured out from his emergency contact to, to who he belonged. I know that he hadn't responded to me in a little bit, so that was like already like one thing. And then I had my mom text me. It was I was at school, and so he hadn't responded to me, and my mom texted me, have you heard from Tucker today? And I was like, no, I haven't. Have you tried calling him? And she said, yeah. And then, like, I tried calling him. And so, there, like, I switched, like, class periods, and I was in second period. And I was like, oh, this feels a little weird. Like, I feel like there's something going on. And then my aunt texted me. It's like something like this is, like, a heartbreak to us all. And I was like, oh, dang it. Like, I, I just kind of knew. So I, like, I asked to go to the bathroom, and I went. I called my mom. She didn't answer. So I called my dad. He didn't answer. I called my stepdad. I was calling everybody else. Like, at that point, I started to, like, freak out a little bit. I was like, oh, my God, like, nobody's answering me. Um, and then my mom called me back, and as soon as she answered, I just kind of knew. I was like, where is he? And she's like, he's not here. And so and then I got kind of had a little meltdown for a little bit in the hallway, but then I packed up all my stuff, and I drove home. And my mom and my dad and my stepdad all were all waiting for me when I got home. Uh, I was on my way to work, and Brandy don't normally call me early in the morning unless it's, you know, a problem. So when I looked at my phone, I seen she was calling. I was like, something happened. I just didn't think it was going to be that. But she ended up telling me he was dead. Uh, I didn't go to work that day. And kind of took a toll on me. Yeah. I was angry, upset, hurt, broke my steering wheel. Yeah. I had to like, pull over on the side of the road and like calm down. It was just really, really hard. I was in Houston for school um, and my sister called me like very frantic. At first she didn't know what was going on. It was just like, you know, I, I don't, our, our brother's hurt, right? And then um, she told me that he passed away and I lost it, broke down. I called my mom, crying frantically. Um, and then shortly after that, she came and got me from school. I was down here that same day um, with the family, which was I felt like was exactly what I needed at the time. Because um, being alone, I probably just would have went crazy. I got a call like real early in the morning from his mom, and uh, she, she like, she would call me and stuff, but it'd never be like that early. In the morning, it was like seven, seven something. And uh, she told me he had, uh, he had overdosed. I just, my heart broke, like, that was my best friend. Like, I, I've never really had a best friend in my life. Like, I've always been moving around and stuff. And, like, that was just my best friend. Like, that was the only person I'd ever, like, really hang out with and do stuff with. So it just, it hurt me. It really hurt me. I was at home alone, and I was already at home feeling kind of weird and stuff like that. And then I eventually got a call from my mom that my brother was deceased. I couldn't really believe it at first, and I didn't want to believe it. Still to this day, it doesn't seem as real as it actually is. 
but I just kind of blacked out and tried to tell myself that it wasn't real or anything like that. But I had to find out at one point that it wasn't all made up and it was actually true. It was the night that, or like the night that he died, um, we were all hanging out and me and him happened to get into an argument or whatever. So we got into this big argument and he leaves. We like, we got along after, but we didn't really say sorry or anything. We kind of just let it go. So he left and my mom comes home and we all go to bed. It was like a normal thing. And in that morning I went to text him like, hey, I'm sorry, like, can we talk about it? Cause that was our relationship. And I was like, okay, the messages aren't going through. He fell asleep on the phone. But then mom is screaming like so loud that we can't hear it. And she runs in my room and she's like, can you not hear me screaming? I go, no. And I kind of like laugh about it. I'm like, why are you screaming? It's like 1130. And she goes, Jonathan's dead. I'm like, why are you lying to me? Like, we just saw him last night. Like it wasn't, we didn't register it as he was dead. So we got in the car and I still didn't believe it. I was like, okay, y'all are like going insane. Like he's alive. And if he's not alive, there's a chance we could save him. And I didn't realize he was dead until they took his body out of the house, covered, and basically took him away. I found out through my grandma. Yeah, Vanessa called me and they just told me that they found him at some hotel. They said his, his jewelry was gone. I don't know, there was just, I heard different things. I heard it was an overdose. I heard it was a robbery. So honestly, I was just more shocked than anything. I was just like, nah, like it, it no, it couldn't be. Yeah, it just, but I mean, it's just, at the same time too, it's just, it's, it's part of life. And especially what he was doing, the crowd he was getting involved with. At the same time too, while I was in denial, I was also, well, you hear it in songs all the time. You hear it in, will I live to be 25, will I live 24, 21? And, and, and it, it sucks because you think about those things, you think about those songs, and it's just like, like a lot of people, they don't make it that, to that age. A lot of people, they, the situations they're in, like it's, it's not just something you hear in songs, it's, it's something in real life. Uh, through all of this, I have learned that sibling loss is the least talked about loss. And probably, I'm not going to say it's even where close to a child, a mother, a parent losing a child, but I have to watch my mom, my parents go through the worst pain in the whole entire world. Me and him, we, you know, ever since we were kids, we were always, of course, you know, siblings always butt heads and fight, but, you know, we, we always had each other's backs and, you know, it was me and him. We actually had a saying, um, it's, uh, that we've always told each other when we were kids and it's, um, it's you and me against the world. And I actually have that tattooed on my arm right here. Um, next to where I have his name, I got his name right there. And I got the quote right there. Just, um, you know, as a reminder that it's, it's still always, you know, you and me against the world. It definitely changed me to like definitely say something next time. Like if any one of my cousins were to do any drug, I like I would definitely say something to their parent, to my mom, to everybody that they're doing it because I wouldn't want something like this to happen again. As you continue on, it just gets like, um, I guess more, I don't know, it gets harder. It's a, It's a... Like this will be our fourth, this is technically my sixth Christmas without my brother. And we used to always spend holidays together since our parents were divorced. We would make sure we were always together for holidays. Um, but while he was in active, re while he was trying to recover, it took away like two holidays from us. And then um, this is gonna be my third round of holidays without him. So that's really hard. I've learned compassion I've learned that I'm never gonna understand why an addict does and at what they do. Um, I myself am not an addict. Um, 
And for a lot of times I tried to like understand and I've wasted a lot of time trying to understand instead of a lot of time, instead of the time I could have given with just compassion. It definitely has changed my outlook on life and I've definitely started to take in life more and just take in every moment I can. And it is, my family's always been close, but just this change has brought us even more close. And we always like to remind each other like how much we love each other and how much we care about each other because we learned that you, you never know and it could be your last time telling someone that you love them. What I wish I would have done differently was just to love him more, tell him I love him more, ask him about his story, ask him, you know, why did you do this? Like, not in a judgmental way, but just trying to understand, even though I could never understand an addict, I can never understand what their struggles are, but I wish I would have tried to understand his perspective and his struggles and let him know that, you know, I was there for him. I was supporting him, not his addiction, not saying to enable them, but just I think it has to be a balance. You don't want to enable them, but you also want them to know that, you know what, I still love you. I wanted people to know that, um, Cedric, just like a lot of addicts, they're not, they're not just addicts. They're more than that, you know? He was very loving. And he had a lot of friends. He loved people. He had a heart for people. And he was so forgiving. Like, you can get into an argument with said, and he would forgive you. And that was, he would always talk about love. And like I said, he, of course, he was not perfect. Addicts, addiction comes with a lot of stuff. And it can be so hard to deal with addicts. You know, Cedric was hard to deal with sometimes. But he had such a great heart. You know, he was somebody's brother. He was my brother. You know, he was my mom's son. So he was just so much more. And I want people to know that he was more than an addict. And he had so much um, to offer this world, even in his addiction and being around people with addiction. He would still try to help them. He would still try to speak life into them and try to help them to get out. And so many people, like after he passed, like on his um, Facebook page, there's so many like messages of how he touched people, like how he encouraged people. He never lost that. And um, that's what I want people to know about him. Mm -hmm. I just feel like a lot of this stuff has hope in my eyes. And it's not necessarily the things. I'm glad that I didn't necessarily have to find out the hard way. But I feel like with all everyone else around me finding out the hard way, I've kind of learned to steer clear of a lot of that stuff. Every time I do the things we do or did, I think about him. Every time I play the game, every time I, I watch one of his favorite movies or listen to his favorite song, I just think about him the whole time. And, and it, it really messes with me. I definitely did talk to um, like a counselor for a little while. It was provided through my school. Um, and she actually was a counselor for my brother as well when he got in trouble for a little while. So it was nice because she like knew him and she had that connection to like my family and stuff. So I talked to her for a while and I didn't really talk to her about Tucker as much as I talked to her about like what was going on in like my own household and stuff. Just like what was happening there because I don't know, it's like on top of like losing somebody so close to you, it's like there's so much happening around that. It's like, and it's like, it's like, do I have to like be like be there for my parents? Like, what do I do? And it's just like, me as less of an emotional person, like I would like to just like stick it out by myself. And it's like, then I have to be there for my mom and my sisters. And just like, it just feels like a lot because it's not only just the losing that person, it's like everything that's happening around that. And it's, like that doesn't just like go away in a couple months, it just it lasts the whole time. I'm not ever gonna lose the way I felt about that day. I still feel that way right now to this day. Stuff in my house goes missing. And it's like my girlfriend's meticulous on putting stuff in certain places. Everything is like 
put up how she wants it, and then stuff just goes missing. It didn't start till like a month or two after he passed. Yeah, he being funny. Yeah. He likes to joke and play games with people. But, I mean, you know, he's still here. You you can't ever, you, you can kill my flesh, but you can't get rid of my spirit. He's still here. You just need to watch who you're around. Just everybody's not your friend. If you need help, just ask for help. There's no shame in asking for help if you got a problem. Kind of feels like I know I have people around me, but like my brother was my best friend and stuff. So sometimes I feel like I don't have anyone and it's just me and stuff like that. I'm doing okay. Um, I would, it doesn't, get, it never gets better, but it definitely gets easier to control yourself and control when you're going to cry or whatever. But it does get easier to live for him or live for your family, knowing that that's what he would want. And it definitely gets easier knowing that He's watching over us, and he didn't really mean to die. Like, it was out of the blue when he died. So I feel like I'm only doing better knowing that we will get justice for him and knowing my mom's by my side, and she will never do anything to harm us or put us in pain. So just having her there helps a lot. Um, so with my mom's help, I feel like I'm doing better than what I was in the beginning. I, I do miss him a lot. I do. Because, I mean, we all looked up to him. Like, me, me and my cousin Mondo. Like, he, he, was, he was literally the cool, the cool cousin, you know? Like, every, like, I met a lot of people because of him. Um, and not only that, like, a lot of them still reach out to me. They're like, hey, how you doing? How's your tia doing? Like, he was very well known. He, he, he was just that cool cousin you looked up to and you wanted to be like him. The great lesson I learned is, you know, nurture your kids. Push them in the right direction. Talk with them. See where their head's at. Um, you know, you always want to try to guide them in the right direction. I only had one friend this whole, while like in the midst of like all the, all the grief, right? The deep, deep grief of the recent scenario that happened. I only had one friend ask me how I was doing. They all asked me about my mom. They all asked me about my dad. I think that's why sibling death is so hard because you are the more forgotten person because it is overshadowed by the loss of a child, which is horrible. And I'm not trying to like, there's no, I don't have any ego with this. I don't think one's worse than the other. I think they all suck. I think. Grief sucks. I think everyone handles it differently. Um, but the fact that I can point out that only one person ever asked me about myself and how I was doing speaks volumes to what sibling loss and why it's so hard.